goes great with a glass of milk. Packing an Operation Christmas Drought shoebox. Okay, let's be honest. Packing an Operation Christmas Drought shoebox can go great with anything. It's so that other kids can learn about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, and it's also a great way to teach your own kids about giving. Teach your kids about giving. giving. Have a great day. Oh, and don't forget, make good choices. So basically, you get an empty box, which any box will work. Really? OK, not any box. Much better. OK, so now you have your empty box. Now you can pick the age range, and if you want it to be for a boy or a girl. OK, come on, please be a boy. Please be a boy. Well. Looks like we're gonna be packing for a boy this year. First, you can choose a wow item, such as a soccer ball wow! or a stuffed animal. Mm. And you can choose other fun toys, too. Hygiene items and school supplies. There are, of course, some items you cannot pack, like liquids, food, Items related to war, live animals. And don't even think about packing chocolate because it melts. No candy and no toothpaste. When your gift is finished, you can write a letter and include a photo. It gives it a nice personal touch. When your box is done, you can make your shipping donation online through Follow Your Box. Simply print off your tracking label to see where the destination of your gift will be. And don't forget, it's important to pray for the child that is receiving this gift. Because packing a box is a simple way to share the gospel with kids all around the world. Maybe even in... Mib... In Africa. Now that your box is done, it's time to get moving. Transport your box to a nearby drop-off location near you. These will be open all across the U.S. on National Collection Week, the third week in November. Drop it off and voila, you pack the shoebox. Easy as one, two, three. Good morning. Good morning. Stand with me. Uh, reading from the New Testament this morning. Hebrews chapter 10. The subtitle of this section of Scripture, beginning with verse 19, is a call to persevere. Beginning in verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Shall we pray? Father, these are great words penned by an anonymous writer. We're not sure. Historians debate that. But what we do know is that they are penned through the power of the Holy Spirit directly from you. And we accept that and we receive that today. And so, Lord, as we come into your house, I pray that you would help us to focus our minds on the things that honor you, to set aside the, the schedules and the, the busyness of the past week and all of the things yet to come this week. And may we just in these next few minutes appreciate you for who you are, faithful, <laughs> provider, savior. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. May your presence permeate this place. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. 
Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Aren't you glad you're here in the house of the Father? Amen. Let's worship Him this morning. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah. Light of the world, light into my life, I will live for you alone. You're the one I see, knowing I will find all I need.
I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. praise you this morning. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Woo. All right. Well, take your worship folder with me this morning. I want to just touch on a couple of things. First of all, if you missed the video at the beginning, uh, we're just ramping up Operation Christmas Child, better known as OCC. And uh, there's an insert about that. The boxes are ready and the display. Pick one of those up and help us out with that. Then, uh, just real quickly, Pizza with Pastors next Sunday. That's at 12 o'clock noon. Looking forward to that myself. And then later that evening, Trunk and Treat out in the parking lot. I think all the, the slots are filled up, but if you want to come and be a part of that, just show up and we'll make room for you. Amen. And we'll have a great evening that night ministering to our community. If you have a, a youth, or you are a youth, a teen, um, or if you're a teen at heart and you want to go to lock in, uh, registration's due this week, I believe. $30 payment. I'm sure Pastor Philip would love to have some additional sponsors go spend an all night with, it, with them and be back at the crack of dawn and all that good stuff. I can't do it anymore. It wipes me out for a week. But it's a good time. If you're a guest with us today, I wanna just really want to thank you for being with us. There's a couple ways that we'd ask that you connect with us. You can, first of all, just take this little tab and tear it off of the worship folder. Or if you're a little techie uh, and you prefer the electronic mode, you can go to our app. It uh, gives you instructions there, DC NAS. You can download that. And there is a, an icon there that uh, is in the upper left-hand corner called Connection Card. You can't read the full word card, but it's there. And you can do that electronically and send that in to us. We appreciate that getting to know you. If you're a regular attender, you have a message for us, please take advantage of that as well and use that as a communication tool. It just helps us out tremendously to be able to uh, have that information because if you tell me walking out the door, I promise you I'm going to forget it. So help us out with that. Thank you for being in worship with us today. Amen. Would you stand with us again as we continue in, in worship and I got a little nervous energy, so I'm trying to work that out. Sorry. But, uh, as I look around, I just cannot help but remember. And I want you to remember. God is here for you. Do you realize that? He's here for no one but you. Man, that's so important to grasp that. Whatever is before you today, we have serve a mighty God. Amen? Amen. And we've all got a story. And God wants to be in the midst of it. Would you allow him? Let's worship him this morning. If I told you my story, you would hear hope that would let go. If I told you my story, you would hear love that never gave up. And if I told you my story, you would hear life, but it wasn't mine. Jesus that draws me in. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of you. If I told you my story, you would 
something on the altar before the Lord. It's a great time. You can do it right there, but man, there's some power in this place because of Jesus Christ. Let's worship Him this morning. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with
to represent a need that's not maybe publicly known. Maybe it is, but you are the intercessor today for that person, that family, that situation. I want to encourage you to do that and just make your way now. And I want to update you on a couple of things. Um, Tom Lane yesterday had a heart attack. He was admitted to the hospital last night, early evening. Uh, the word this morning is that he is responding and doing well and probably will have a, the vent removed a little bit later today, so we're rejoicing with the Lord over that one. And then you may notice that Pastor Justin and Heather and the family are not here. Um, Heather's grandmother passed away. They're traveling uh, back from Wisconsin the next, uh, probably today and tomorrow. Remember them in your prayers as they travel. But God would just, uh, that was a tough situation for for them and uh, we just, I've just prayed all along that God would just blow their minds away about what he wanted to do in that environment and that situation and I just uh, I believe that God is able to do that so this morning as we go to prayer if you feel led to come down and represent one of those needs that was mentioned or others I encourage you to do that let's go to the father God, we've come to this point in time with intention. Each week, we, we intentionally set a time in our service where we can respond and come uh, to this, this place of grace that surrounds the sanctuary right here. And I'm so thankful for an altar. As a young boy, And all through my life, it's been a very sacred place. It's been a place where I've brought my deepest concerns and, and troubles in my life, but it's also been a place where I've celebrated some of my greatest joys that you have allowed to enter into my life. And so today, as these individuals have come, and they're representing needs, or perhaps they're representing those joys. I pray, God, that you would be in every one of them, that you would meet them where they are, specifically, as you are an incredibly big God who is capable of making everything so personal and being able to be intimate with us one-on-one -on -one as human beings. So today, hear the cries of your people. I pray for Tom today. I, I, I think that there's a, actually a procedure going on about this time. God, would you guide those doctors? We, we prayed last night with him that, that you would use whatever means to work a miracle. Father, the fact that uh, the location where he was and people were there immediately to administer first aid and CPR, that, that's a miracle in itself. He, may, he could have very well been by himself at home or in the shop working, and, and nobody would have found him for minutes, hours, who knows. But we believe by your provision that that was, that was there. And so God, to use the medical profession, we believe in the power of healing, miraculously and through 
the means of medicine. And, and God, we just ask that you would uh, use that uh, today and, and, and continue in his healing. Father, we pray for Shauna this morning. Just emotionally spent last night. We understand that. But her desire was to, to be in your word, to be communing with you, even in the time of, of, of incredible pressure and tension, she was focused on you. Thank you for her testimony this morning. I pray that you would just go with and be with her there as she's in the waiting room and in the hospital later today. And then, Lord, I pray for Pastor Justin and his family. As they travel this day and make their way back on a long journey and long trip, I pray that you would make that, that time in the car um, a special time as they kind of decompress over the weekend and everything that took place and the passing of Heather's grandmother. And God, just, just be right there in that vehicle with them. Minister to their heart and the brokenness that's there because of loss. And bond them together as a family. We love our pastor. We want him to be grounded in who you need him to be, a man of God that, that brings the word and is not hesitant to, to speak truth, even though it may be a, offensive to some, but you have called him to be our leader. And I pray that you would anoint him. I pray for their marriage, Lord. Make it stronger. May they uh, enjoy the best years of their lives. Protect their family. God, just keep the evil away from an environment where he would love to get in and tear things up. I just pray that protection upon them today. And I know you're a faithful God and you, you hear the cries of your people, you hear the prayers, you hear the intercession going on for all of the needs that are represented here today and we just we're we're overwhelmed and and honored that you would invite us into such a sacred time lord this morning your word has already spoken to us from the call to worship we're going to look at a, a pretty familiar parable with a little different meaning perhaps for some of us and a challenge for all of us to go out and live it and apply it in our lives. And so would you uh, just take the reading of the word? Would you bless it? Would you allow it to, to seep into our lives perhaps differently than it ever has? And then uh, embolden us to live it out. In just a moment, we're going to have an awesome privilege of, of continuing in an act of worship of giving our tithes actually belong to you everything does and you allow us to be stewards of what you've blessed us with and so we ask that you would uh, as we give that you would multiply it over and we know that we are a part of an international church that ministers 24 hours a day the sun never sets on the church of the nazarene we're thankful for that but with that is a big responsibility and so help us to be faithful in in giving and and going above and beyond and, and being vessels that you can pour through financially. And Lord, we, we just thank you again that you invite us into this privilege of, of giving. Not only of our finances, but our time and our talent. And we just want to be that vessel that you can pour through because we know that, that we can be greater th through you living in and through us. Thank you for many blessings in our lives. Thank you for this special time of prayer and bless us now as we continue in our worship time today. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Stacy's going to come and sing for us, but don't forget that this is Pastor Appreciation Month. Honor your pastors and love on them and pray an extra prayer for them. And if you'd like to give specifically to that, you can mark that on your check as well. But this is Pastor Appreciation Month. We just want to remind you. Thank you.
on okay our scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 8 verses 1 through 15 this is the parable of the sower after this Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God the twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, 
it was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of parable. The seed is the word of God. These along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the work, their the word away from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way they are choked by life's words, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by preserving, produce a crop. Parker got up this morning. I'm going to tell on you, Parker. Is that all right? He told his dad, he said, I don't know if I want to get up in front of everybody and read that scripture. And I told his dad, I said, I know exactly how he feels. <laughs> I know exactly how he feels. Sometimes that's hard, but man, thank you, the Reinerson men, for break, uh, reading the word to us. Inside your worship folder, you'll find a little insert like this. I want you to pull that out and, and keep that handy. We're going to come back to that. And continuing in the sermon series, Changing Gears, Pastor Justin asked me to address this topic because he thought it kind of fit underneath my umbrella of responsibility and ministry, and I, I think I can get us there at the end, okay? If you just hang with me long enough, I hope that we'll uh, come to a consensus that mission accomplished. Uh, this parable is uh, considered one of the foundational parables of, uh, of all parables. Many uh, say that it's the starting point of of understanding kingdom principles. And this certain, it certainly has a strong foundation in understanding the gospel and man's opportunity to respond to the gospel. In this application, the seed is the word of God. Jesus sets this straight. He, he says it explicitly in the conversation with the disciples after the parable was told to the crowd. The different types of soils represent the receptivity of the heart to the word of God. Types of soils, I have four pictures here. They kind of represent the descriptors uh, that were given in Je by Jesus in, in the parable. We have the, the pathway where some of the seed fell along the path. We know from Jesus' parable what happened to that. We have the stony soil, ground that's just covered with rocks. And then the third type was the, that that kind of got overtaken by the thorns. And then the fourth type of soil was the good soil that produced um, many times over, multiplied. A few weeks ago, I shared this diagram with you on the journey to wholeness. I, I've become, as you know, I'm, I'm a fanatic of this uh, understanding that, that life is truly a journey. And the perspective of a believer, a disciple of Jesus, should be that we are journeying to wholeness in him. Not in our own selves, not in our own abilities, but it's by dying out to him and allowing him to consume us. Now, there's a process. And it stops real quickly. Just uh, I want to hit them again. Ignorance of sin. There are people in our world that have no idea what sin is. They've never heard what sin is. Um, they have no idea what definition of it. They have no idea that they were born into it. It's a realistic uh, reality because we live in a fallen world that, that we, we are uh, born into sin, into our lives, into this world. Number two, aware but indifferent to sin. That means there was an awakening point that came and, and they didn't know what to do with that. 
Many of us were there. We've walked that journey. We were confronted with this thing. We didn't know what to do. At number three, concerned about possible effect of sin, we started thinking about that. Hmm, I wonder if there's something to this. And if there is, I might be in trouble. Number four is addressing sin by accepting Christ. What a great uh, moment in our lives where we surrender our life and ask Jesus to forgive us of our sin and invite him in. And then we talked a little bit briefly um, in the pre prior presentation about how, you know, sometimes we in the church, we're, we're not, forgive us. <laughs> because we, we are excited about what we do around here and, and we want to bring you in on with us. And sometimes we get too excited and sometimes we get overcommitted and, and sometimes that leads to that burnout, increased re religious activity. And probably the word there is to focus on is religious because it's, it's more about us trying to please God thinking that we have to do that rather than doing it out of the love of our heart. And number six, that often, uh, you know, we get frustrated, holy discontent, and you really begin to scratch your head and wonder. Even though at point four, stop four, you accepted Jesus into your heart, you get to six, four, five, six, and seven, and you start questioning your faith. Well, and then you see things continue to happen in your life or in other people's lives that you love very dearly, and you begin to question, is this really real? I mean, if God really loves me, why is this crud going on in my life? Anybody there? Been there? I have. But there's a sweet moment, a second sweet moment, where we begin to, to surrender and, and we submit. And we understand then that, ah, I don't have to walk this journey in my own strength and my own abilities. Thank you, Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and actually indwells us, comes into us. And that point of sub submission and surrender leads to, stops 9 and 10, this profound love for God that can't be explained, can't be put into words, it just needs to be lived out. And it's also, as Jesus commanded us, it has to be lived out to our neighbor. You know the one that kind of gets on your nerves once in a while? I don't think I'm direct neighbors to anybody here, so... <laughs> It's, it's just uh, for illustrative purposes, all right? Ten stops. So as I, as I reflected on the parable and this passage of Scripture and, and, and I brought it back to this diagram, I, I wonder if you can see some comparisons between or some continuity between um, the different types of soils and different stops on the journey to wholeness. For example, along the path. Do you see anywhere in the 10 stops where yeah, there might be a connection here? Let me go to the next slide. Along the path, we know that in verse 5 it says, uh, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Can you identify with any of those stops that, uh, did we lose it? It's coming back up. Any of those stops where that could be a reality stop one is there is just total ignorance of sin stop two um, we're suddenly confronted with this idea of sin but we don't do anything with it I kind of resonated in my mind um, verse six some of the seed fell on the stony or rocky soil in verse six it says some fell on the rock and when it came up the plants withered because they had no moisture how about in the diagram? I, I kind of resonated uh, at two, possibly stop four. New life, born again, but we didn't grow that. Stop, or I'm sorry, the verse seven, it says, among the thorns. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. You see in this picture, there's, there's green uh, growth underneath that. So the, the, the growth is still there, but what's overpowering it all? The thorns. I, I happen to, uh, I mean, that, that's just life happening, okay? So for us to have this false image of when I come to stop four and I accept Christ as my Savior and I 
ask him to forgive me of my sin, that it's all going to be rosy and peachy keen. It's not reality. We live in a fallen world. We're still subject to being part of that fallen world. I saw, uh, saw this kind of maybe happening in stops five, six, and seven. The seed sprouts and develops, but it's soon consumed by other cases, uh, by other things, and in this case, the thorns. When Peter was out on the, the lake with the, his other disciples, he saw Jesus coming to him, he, and Peter just, you know, Peter. Did, did, does anybody ever think Peter probably annoyed the other disciples? <laughs> I mean, he had to. Still got to love him, though, right? He wanted to go out and, and meet Jesus, so he steps out of, of the boat. You know what? He did really good until what? He took his eyes off of Jesus. He didn't stay focused on the one who had called him. Then we have the good soil in verse 8. It says, Still other seed fell on good soil that came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And I see this in multiple steps. Stop, uh, stops, I'm sorry. Stop four, stop five, eight, nine, and ten. And I believe that even in stop six and seven, when our faith is wavering, when we're frustrated and we are broken, he is still there. We need to embrace that. And I appreciate the application of uh, the parable, this one in particular, parable of the sower, parable of the soils, with the gospel message and, and the conflict that takes place in our personal lives when we're confronted with the gospel message for the first time, and even when we're presented with truth in our lives day to day, when the, the Spirit prompts us. But I want us to consider another application of the parable. I'd like to, to look at uh, the two primary components of the parable, which is the seed and the different soils in a slightly different way. I believe this is, is viable because the biblical alternative perspective comes out of a con conversation that's recorded right here in the passage that was read a little bit earlier. And this conversation occurs between Jesus and his, this rough group of 12 people, guys, that were consistently following him around. And I believe that if the seven or the ten stops on the journey to wholeness diagram had been available for the disciples, they would have pulled it out and they said, you know what, I can relate. I can relate to this. Oh, they believed in Jesus, and Jesus had called them to, he said, hey, come follow me. They were following him. They were being obedient. But the, the struggle was real for them to surrender and submit. You know that stop, stop eight. Even for the disciples, Jesus in their view had to have been struggling with that. We know that because the text confirms that. Multiple occasions where the disciples wrestled with that complete confidence and surrender. I'm confident that they experienced all of the stops just like we do. Now, they were on the other side of the cross, right? We live on this side of the cross. Nonetheless, the journey was much the same for them. Increased religious activity. You want us to feed all these people? Holy discontent. Brokenness, every bit of it, they walked it. I want to go back to what Jesus said to the crowd. We, we find these words in verse 8. Whoever has ears. These, this is not a, a foreign phrase. It's in the text multiple times. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The statement in verse 8 speaks volumes. Everyone there, as far as we know, had ears. There wasn't any recording of miraculous, like, you know, there's Peter again chopping the ear off of the, the soldier. Jesus heals it in the garden. None of that is here. So we're quite confident that there was no healings of, of, of deaf people. 
I think we can make the statement that, that everyone there had ears. There were no healings. And, and Jesus is clearly painting this picture for us because everyone had ears to hear, but not everyone was listening. Perhaps the same is true today. Uh, right here. We can hear him, but are we listening? Jesus was saying that not everyone was willing to listen. And for most of us here today, it's not the voice of invitation to the gospel message, although there are some here today who are still wrestling with that. They haven't made that decision to follow and, and to ask Christ into their life personally, and I really highly recommend that. Jesus made it really simple. It's the ball's in our court. The gift is there for us to open. Instead, I think uh, what we're missing here and what we're hearing but not living out is this voice of guidance, of godly wisdom and direction that we struggle to hear in this journey we've been talking about that would allow us to mature our faith. So uh, some questions this morning. Do we as Dodge City Nazarenes believe that the seed is still being sown today? Do you believe that? Uh, the seed is the word of God, right? Is the word of God still being proclaimed and being spread all over? Yes. Do we believe that the word of God is still being sown? Absolutely. Do we believe that the voice of God is still resonating throughout our world? You bet. Most of us respond, well, of course I do. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I confess my sin. I'm in. Ooh. I'm in, so what more is there? And I challenge us to consider the answer to that question of what more is there by considering the response a whole bunch. Look what John uh, records in his 16th chapter, verses 20, I'm sorry, 12, 12 and 13, John 16, 12 and 13. Words of Jesus, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Anyone eaten, eaten out lately? Just raise your hand. Wave at me if you've eaten out lately. Okay, most of us. All right. How many of you have ordered an appetizer recently when you went into the restaurant? Sure. Most of us have at some point, maybe not recently. Why do we do that? Just talk back. Talk back to me. Your mother said not to do that, but talk back to me. You're hungry. You're, you're, you're famished. You, you need something to take the hunger away until the main entree comes, right? That is the purpose of that appetizer. So the waitress comes, gets the order for our drinks and, and, and the appetizer, and she delivers that appetizer, a server does later. We pass the plates around the table. Everybody gets a sampling of that. And as soon as we're done, finished, oh, you know about that last onion ring on the plate? Or that last chicken strip or chip and dip or whatever. You know, everybody's looking at it. It's like, mm -hmm. I really want that, but I don't want to be rude. After it's all gone, we all promptly fold our napkins, get up, push our chairs in, go pay the bill and go home, right? No. We're waiting for the entree, the main dish, to, to arrive after the appetizer, right? It would be silly for us to go in, order our appetizer and the entree, finish the appetizer, and leave, right? Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and, and go back to this, this time when the disciples are questioning Jesus after the parable is spoken. And they come up to him and they ask, what does this parable mean? 
And then Jesus goes on and explains the meaning of the parable. And it's a little bit like the disciples were not going to be satisfied with just the appetizer. They wanted the full meal. They wanted to know what it meant. Now, they'd heard the message, but they wanted to know how it worked in their lives. In this case, the appetizer, if you will, had been received in the parable. And they waited around for the entree. In fact, they asked for it. They sought out Jesus and wanted to know. And in verse 9, it's recorded those words when they actually asked Jesus, what does this mean? This was their time to dig deeper into the meaning of what Jesus was teaching. And, and do you know that on this day, throughout this community and beyond, there will be many people who will walk into a house of worship this morning. They will receive their appetizer and they will be content and they will walk out the door never entering into the main entree. You know, it'll happen here unless we're really, really tuned in to what God is saying. God is looking for people that will not only hear his word, but will listen to his word and then respond in action. I want to introduce you to the circle today. Now, I apologize because in the slides, you bring that next one up. It's a, is it called an ellipse? Where are my math people? Is a circle when you squish it down, is that ellipse? Okay. So it, it's a, a bit, oh, well, maybe they fixed it. So that looks pretty good, actually, but... The circle. I have, I have, if you visit my office, you'll see a whole set of wooden blocks. When I moved to Missouri, they said this was my uh, Missouri iPad. <laughs> they accused me of that. It does have information on it, and it's usable. So. <laughs> These are tools that I picked up as, as a, a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. You know, a disciple is, is equivalent to the word learner. I want to learn about Jesus. And these, these uh, blocks just have a little note scribbled on them. They help, they help solidify in my mind because I'm a visual kind of person. They help solidify this journey that I'm on. I want to invite you into the journey. Uh, today, um, there's a lot of symbolism here that fit in this slide and on your piece of paper. First of all, I want to talk about uh, the measure of time. The measure of time, um, for our purposes, I want to divide it into two descriptors. One would be uh, chronos, or this time right here, it's 11.30. At 10.30, we start at worship. At around 12 o'clock, we'll exit, leave, go home. It, it's that, that specific time, chronos. Chronological comes from that. It has to do with order and structure and this event, then this event, this and that, this event. And it, it, there's, it's typically tied to our time that we were on our watch, a wrist, or a, on the clock and display. But there's another element of time that's repre represented in the scriptures called uh, kairos. Um, these, are, these are significant events that take place in your life. Your birth. You remember that one, don't you? No. We watched some videos of our daughters being uh, born that we had taken. That was kind of reliving that moment. That was kind of cool, but and they'll get to experience that, but kairos moments are those things, those events that occur in our lives. Marriage is one of them. Um, your children being born, graduation, all of those things. Those are all events that, uh, they're kairos moments. And so, if you will kind of follow along with me today, the blue arrows on your paper and on the, on the screen represent this, this linear progression of life. It's uh, from the left-hand side, it's birth until the right-hand side until we leave. Those blue arrows represent that. But along the journey, many, many, many times, and I'm convinced that we miss a lot of them, there are these kairos moments where God is speaking into our life specifically about things that are of concern to him, perhaps in our life, or he's trying to grow us and expand our knowledge and, and test our faith and strengthen our faith. These kairos moments come into our lives to take us, I believe, into what we'll, we'll call the learning circle. 
Now, there's two things that you need to begin to ask, two questions that you begin to ask yourselves once you enter into this, this learning circle. In other words, there's a, there's, a, there's a recognition in your spirit and in your being. Sometimes it could be an audible voice. Sometimes it could be somebody speaking to you that triggers something in your mind that, that, that draws you to, to consider more deeply your spiritual journey. The two questions that come up are the first one, what is God trying to say to me? You need to very definitively identify, well, what is God saying to me? If it was my best friend that relayed the message, yeah, you need to filter that. If it was the pastor on Sunday morning, you need to filter that. Okay? The second question to follow it up with is once you've figured out what God is trying to say to you, it becomes ownership on our part. What am I going to do about it? Because he will, I am convinced that the Holy Spirit will constantly shape us and make us by speaking into our spirit to make us more like Christ. It's an everyday, multiple times a day event. And I mentioned, I, I think sometimes we, we miss them. So two questions, what is God trying to say to me and what am I going to do with it? Now I want to focus on the two elements out to, the, to, to the right-hand side and the curve. Uh, that looks like an ellipse now, doesn't it? Repent and believe. Repent, you know, how many of you just live for the moment when you can go to your spouse and apologize for something that you did or said? You just, that just drives you. I just love to do that. Probably not most of us, but it's, it's part of the journey, isn't it? Sometimes we have to go to our kids and say, you know what, I, I missed it that, that time. When I disciplined you, I was, I was not thinking clearly and I overdid it and I need you to forgive me repentance is is a wonderful thing but it's really challenging and hard and difficult the other part uh, on the other side of that is is believe and and that has uh, everything to do with faith and putting it into action so let's I want to give you these uh, steps that you go through first of all on the Right hand side is uh, repent. The first blank is to observe. And that involves uh, observing what's going on around you, the situation that you're in, getting the word out and, and reading the word and, and, and looking to see what God's word is speaking into you. Secondly, right underneath that is the word reflect. The, the, as Christians, we're called to think, okay? I'm, I'm naturally that way, an analytical kind of person, but, and I've been prone to knee-jerk reactions, don't get me wrong. They usually hurt, and I have to go back and repent when I do it. But reflecting on what, what uh, again, read the word. Okay, what, what are you wanting to shape in my life according to that? And the third element of that, repent, is to discuss. Yeah. You know, we like to isolate, don't we? When we it's a natural tendency, I think, some, from some of us. Most of us, maybe. I don't know. I'm speaking for myself. When God is really hammering on me, and I, and I use that in a loving way, I want God to hammer on me. But when he is... The tendency is to isolate. And part of what we are learning in, in terms of dynamics in, in the Christian walk is there's power in sharing. And here's why. Most of the time it's because somebody else is going through the same thing you are and they have maybe some words of wisdom for you or just nonetheless, they're, you know someone else is journeying with you. They're with you. So, working through the, the steps of repent or repentance, then we move to the side of believing. Now we've, we've observed, we've reflected, we've discussed, we now are going to put our faith into actions and we develop this plan. Now, you might think this, this isn't an awful lot of stuff to be focusing on and thinking about as I go through these, every situation in my life. It gets easier and it gets quicker. 
Because you begin to, the more that you exercise it and practice, it becomes you know, part of who you are. But I want to challenge you today to, to put this up someplace in you where you'll see it frequently and reflect upon it for a, a little while, a few weeks, and see if, if God isn't uh, speaking something into your being. So you have a, a plan that you develop, that you come up with, and, and that can be developed in community. It could be developed just according to God's word. But there's always an element of accountability. Because... You need that in your life. I need that in my life. I need to be held accountable for what I'm doing as, and, and as a follower of Jesus and a disciple. And then the last part of that is just to act it out, live it out. Put it into action. The, uh, the title of the, the message in your worship folder was immense to intimate or corporate to accountability. This is where it falls in under my realm of responsibility and ministry. You've heard me say before that it is impossible in this setting to get to know one another. I mean, we have, what, two minutes to... The timer's running. Two minutes. Go meet and greet. Spread the peace. You can't, you can't, uh, you can spread some peace, but it's not going to be very thick in two minutes. You can't get to know someone at the level that, that we need to know our brothers and sisters in Christ. Corporate to accountable. Um, this, uh, corporate, together as a group, um, it's very difficult for us to be accountable to one another in this setting. But I've, I know a place where you can Small groups, Sunday school class, uh, a group of guys or gals getting together for breakfast. It can happen anywhere, anytime, but it has to be with intention. And you have to build some parameters into that, healthy parameters. I, li I like the three words of connect, grow, and multiply. Connect, grow, and multiply. That really, to me, is the vision of, of every small group. It's, it's a, pr a place for you to connect at a deeper level. And those of you that are isolationists, that like to be by yourself, it's, it's hard. You've got to be vulnerable. But there's great growth that comes out of that when we are willing to do that. And that's the uh, second element of, of growing expanding our relationship with one another, but also with our Heavenly Father. And then the element of multiply. Um, Calvin brought in some samples from the field this morning. And I, I love my agricultural background. My grandfather uh, poured a lot of himself into my life. I'll be forever grateful for that. But I, I was always amazed, uh, being in Iowa, we grow a lot of corn in Iowa. Now you can take a seed this size, put it in the ground about so many inches apart from one another, and pretty soon, in just a matter of weeks, you can go back into the field and harvest something like this. Now the multiplication rate on this, I don't know what it is exactly, but I'm told that um, when you're putting the seed in the ground, typically on the average you put about a bushel of seed into the ground to produce the harvest. So a bushel of corn um, in our country, where I'm from, 200 bushel to the acre is not uncommon. So you get one to 200. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Would you agree that's multiplication? <clears throat> you can't even see this. This is a Milo seed. It's about the size of, wow, what do I compare that to? A BB. Yeah. It's about the size of a BB. They tell me that about 30,000 of these seeds go in per acre. That's about a bushel. 30,000 of those BBs go in the ground about six to seven inches apart. Am I still on, Calvin? 
Okay, correct me if I get off. And I'm told that one of those seeds can produce this many seeds. Now, I didn't count them, but I, I'm thinking that there's probably, this is like a one to a 800 to 1,000 return. Do you agree with that multiplication? Again, a bushel of, of seed multiplies over. Now, so how does that, that really challenges me when, when we're called as disciples of Jesus to multiply. Go, go make disciples. That's what Jesus commanded us to do. And you know, you're, you're sitting here today because somebody did that. You think about that? You're in this environment today because somebody was willing to multiply themselves. Either through reaching out to your family, reaching out to you personally, speaking words into you uh, from a little guy or gal on up. Somebody was willing to do that. That's a very challenging question to me personally is am I willing to do that I would ask you the same what's interesting about this parable uh, hmm, this just blew me away when I went back to look at it again and I actually highlighted some words and underlined things in my Bible that, that I want to touch on this morning first of all seed um, the seed was exactly the same in every Four so all of those four, four soil types. They weren't, weren't experimenting with different seed combinations. I mean, the, the word, word of God, that's what it was. It's constant, never changing, always faithful, always true. The seed was the same. It was the soil type that inhibited the growth of the seed and eventually the multiplication of the seed. It's the condition of the soil that determines the growth. When the seed and the soil are not compatible, the seed will not develop and reproduce. So I guess uh, if you take the seed, you have to look at the soil. And the soil represents the receptivity of our heart. So I can tell you this morning with great confidence that there's nothing wrong with the seed. It is not diminished in value. It has not changed over all of these years. So what's the variable? The soil, our heart. So how do we get our, our heart and our soil, figuratively speaking, in a, in a position to be receptive to the seed? And I, and I believe that it takes those elements of, of, that, of repentance. You have to have a heart that, that longs to hear God speak into your life. That you wake up in the morning and you, you, you have this attitude and maybe even verbalizing, God, what, what is it you want to do through me today? What do you want to do in me today? So I always like to leave uh, people, because I am a thinker, I want to leave you thinking today. And I want to challenge you to examine the soil. Because that's the only thing that we have control over. The seed is established. We're not going to change it. It's not going to be changed by any... There will be people and there will be uh, obstacles in our lives that will try to diminish the, the power of the seed, but and ultimately it comes down to our heart and, not, and the soil. Do we have receptive soil? Do we have the soil that would invite that seed in? Or are we consumed by other things around us? Or maybe we're not even doing anything with that seed that's been placed in our life. And somebody's going to come along or some being, something is going to come along and snatch it away. And the scripture says that's the enemy. And he indeed will do that. Some of us, you know, the, the soil's just a little rocky. And the rocks, they've come because of disappointment. 
they've come because of hurt. People, people in the church hurt me. I'm not going to go there. I can't go there. That's the condition of the soil of their heart. Others are really, they have the desire and the passion. They, they're like the seed that fell in the thorns. They, they, it sprouts and it, and it grows, but it's never able to flourish the way it could because it's so consumed by other things around it. And then, wow, <laughs> there's the good soil that says, I can reproduce hundreds of times. How many people do you think you could impact for Christ in your lifetime? Hundreds? Thousands? Your sphere of influence is unlimited. So today, I just leave you at that thought. What's the condition of your soil? And do you want to change it if it's not where you want it to be? If it's not good soil, are you willing to change it? This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, I, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share your word this morning. I hope that I haven't stood in the way of anyone understanding or receiving it. My prayer was to be a vessel that you would flow through and that your words would be mine. I just believe in our journey of life, it's always good for us to reflect and in many cases, repent and believe again. And there are a lot of ways that we can get sidetracked and the thorns of life just kind of at times consume us. And There are times when we've just been so stubborn in our own spirit that we didn't want to receive what you have for us. And there, there are other times when, quite honestly, we've let somebody steal what you intended for us. The enemy stole it away because the soil of our heart wasn't receptive. If we're to be the effective at, at what you've called us to do, and that's to be a follower of Jesus. Would you help us to be the type of soil that's receptive to receive what you have for us? The future of the kingdom work is dependent upon our obedience. It's challenging. I, I don't think it's near as challenging as what your disciples faced in their days of ministry past the day of Pentecost when many of them were martyred. Some would say all. For their beliefs, for their convictions, for the things that you taught them, that you spoke into their life. So today we just want to be receptive to what you want to speak into our life. For some today, this is a Kairos moment. The Spirit's uh, working in their heart right now. The Spirit is saying, I want to take you to a different place in your life. I want you to experience a different type of soil in, in your spiritual life that's receptive to the seed.
I think just in this moment of, of silence while the keyboard's playing that I would be missing what you're telling me if I didn't offer the opportunity for anyone that wanted to come forward to make a public statement. But most importantly, a statement to you that I need to change the soil type. So as we just wait in this moment, would you just speak into our lives? Father, my personal prayer for each one of us is that we always leave this place different than we entered, changed and transformed more and more into the image of, of Jesus. May it be so today. The passage of Scripture that we open the service with is fitting for our closing Hebrews 10 23 let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I can think of no words more fitting for us today. Would you stand with us? And I don't want to quench the spirit, but I, I think there's something about that verse 23, holding to the hope that we profess. And the worship team is going to lead us uh, in the song in closing. I pray that God would be upon you the rest of this day, throughout the night, and into the week. And may you be equipped to go and serve and be his hands and his feet. Amen. Will we follow the Lord? Let's worship him this morning. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow All your ways All your ways are good All your ways are sure I will trust in you alone Higher than my sight I above my life I will trust in
You will. 